Welcome to Training Unleashed, the show that will help you design and deliver training that's off the chain and will make a difference. Now, here's your host, Evan Hackle. Welcome, everyone, to another incredible episode of Training Unleashed. Today, we're talking about like one of my most favorite topics, which is culture. Because to me, everything is about culture. Ultimately, great culture defines companies. And one of the things we can do in the training world is help build that culture and create that culture. We are very fortunate today to have Tabitha Laser with us. She is the author of Organization Culture Killers. And one of the things about Tabitha that I really like is she's real world. She's worked in the corporate world for years and years and years. She is now a keynote speaker, a coach, and an expert in culture. Um, but this is relatively recent. So we've got somebody with real world experience. Tabitha, welcome to the show and tell us all a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Tabitha Laser, and I appreciate you having me on. I have a huge passion for culture and am trying to really make a difference in the world and, and change the direction we're going now into something more positive for my children and for other people's children and our future leaders and the future of our world. And I really hope that I can share with your listeners some valuable tips that will help them join the journey that I'm on to make a positive impact in the world. I love that. <clears throat> I love that because I think people undervalue their individual contribution to the world because how you be impacts everybody, mm -hmm. everybody. Yes, Let's take this to the world of training now. What can we do as training leaders to create that culture that really works and to be the change that you're describing? Yeah, so I think the biggest pitfall we fall under in training is that we tend to focus on the subject matter versus the actual actual learning that's going on and the competency levels that are absorbed and delivered after the training is over. So I don't know about you, but I've sat in a lot of training programs where somebody gets up and they have slides, they go through the slides, um, they have a test with 10 questions, people answer the test, and oh, they're trained and they know what to do. Uh, and they can that's the whole reason for the podcast is bad training is awful, great training unleashes unlimited possibilities. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. And, and I, I'm a big advocate for actual training that involves some type of dem demonstration of competency more than just a test. So if there's an online training program, it's great. But if all I have to do is answer some questions, you know, when it pauses and says answer a question, that may not be actually demonstrating the competency. Where there's some really good programs out there where you actually have to physically, you know, put the equipment in the right place or, or whatever uh, the case may be. Um, when I do training programs, um, one example, uh, one of the keynotes I do is communicating better. Because a lot of folks, even when training, we get told we don't listen. Have you ever heard that? Don't listen? All the time. Right. I was told that for years and years. And it wasn't until I had a really special leader who stood up and said, you know what? I, you have a lot of potential, but here's what I think you're missing. And he, he put me into some programs where I got that hands-on, one-on-one kind of attention. And come to find out, it wasn't that I wasn't listening. It was that I was only listening with my ears. And I wasn't using all my senses. And I talk about this a lot with communicating you need body language. You know, you need to be looking at what people are saying. How are they standing? And in training, it's the same thing. So one thing I've learned when delivering training is 
you know, if I'm delivering training and everybody's feet are pointed towards the door, that means they're not listening to what I'm saying. Their attention is whatever's outside that door, whether it's lunch is being served, they want to go back to work, they're not getting anything out of it. They don't even know they're doing it. But that communicating better keynote that I do, I actually hand out um, a communicating bingo game where during intermission or breaks, I'll ask everybody to go out and observe people's body language as they talk about different subjects and document them and come back and turn it in for, you know, some type of prize drawing. But the feedback I get from that is, oh my gosh, you know, these, some of these are old folks like us and they come back and say, we've never, we've never been told this. And I know that because I was there, right? I was the one going, why aren't people, why aren't people buying into what I'm selling? And a lot of it was because I wasn't listening and I wasn't addressing their concerns and needs in a way that made them want to buy what I was selling, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. And, you know, you're, you're talking about being, you're, you're talking at people, not to people, you know, would be a, a great example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the difficulties is if, you know, we're sitting here talking about skill levels, if you're presenting to a group, how do you listen when you're talking? Yeah, yeah. So that is a skill you have to practice. And you can't always see everybody. You know, if I'm speaking to thousands of people, I can't see them all. So one thing I try to do in all my training presentations is is try to develop the materials in a way that reaches all the different types of behavioral attributes that people have. So there are attributes of some that are like, just get to the point already and get done. I don't have time for this. And there are others that want the long discussions, right? I want all the details. Tell me everything. I won't trust it. You know, I grew up in Missouri, (laughs) right? And you have those. Um, You have some that if you call on or you give prizes, it'll turn them off and they'll stop listening completely because they don't want attention. So I try to develop little bits and pieces of all my training programs to feed to those different attributes so that people keep engaged throughout. So it's not just me standing in front of somebody talking. I'll have exercises throughout, you know, where people get engaged. I'll have parts where we get a little bit more into the details. Uh, Sometimes I'll break out groups and have those that are more impatient be leading the break out in the hands-on so that they're explaining it to the people who want the details. So they're keeping hmm. engaged. That's yeah. a really interesting concept. Yeah. So it's, it's really about trying to integrate all those different aspects into the training when I, del- when I deliver training and when I do train the trainer programs, which I've done pretty much my entire career, I try to really make sure that the trainer's, are grasping the subject, can demonstrate the subject. I have not passed many people before. So I, I, I've paid the $2,000 and gone to a training program and everybody passes, even the guy that was sleeping in the back corner. Yeah. That's, that's not good training. <laughs> you know, and they're going out and training people. That's a problem. Um, so I, I take that very seriously. Um, every, it's like the game of telephone. Everywhere we take shortcuts or we don't make sure that people are grasping what we're talking about. We're changing the message potentially. And that message as it trickles down turns into deadly practices, which are covered in, in my book and the series that'll be following it, you know, Um, which which gets me to the next question. Yeah. Which is you're about culture. Yes. And your book is, you know, sort of, culture killers. Mm -hmm. What are some of the big culture killers you see? Uh, There's so many. When I started, I was like, this is going to be one book. And then as I started pulling all the notes together, it was going to be like eight inches thick. Um, My son said, make it like the magic Treehouse series. And I said, you know what? I'm making this for you guys, the future generations, the future leaders. So that's what I did. And uh, those big ones that, gosh, I started with deadly expectations for a reason. Um, 
because I see over and over again where organizations don't clearly define what success even means, and they don't define the expectations for the people delivering the success to be able to deliver successfully. I mean, how can you deliver something that you don't know where you're trying to get to? So right? it's like running Tabitha, a race in a circle. Tabitha, for, for, all the, for all the listeners here, that was just gold. If you got gold. anything out of it, total gold, which is organizations culturally don't find success. And I'll go further. They move the goalpost. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And when you don't find success, <clears throat> people are totally frustrated. And I think it's cool you brought your kids in here and they, you know, like divide the book up because younger generations want shorter bits, which, by the way, is smart because you can only retain so much. Mm -hmm. um, but they also want to know how to win. They want to yeah. know how to win more than anybody wants to know how to win because they're playing video games and they're, you know, goal driven. Yes. So that first point, really good. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's get some more for our audience, though. What's what other thing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that just because you mentioned that with the small books, one of the approaches I took was I broke it into chapters that organizations can use to help the future generations feel that like they're adding value. So that's one of the biggest complaints right now. And that's why the millennial group, they don't stay long. 50% of the workforce and they're out so quick because everybody's data overloaded, too busy, you know, all of this going on. They're not, they're not investing that time with the people that we used to do, right? To develop their competency levels and help them feel valued. So I've written the books in a way that you can take each chapter, for example, with your up and coming leaders or aspiring leaders. And you can take the chapter, have a two hour meeting, you know, assign them to read it, come back, have a two hour meeting and say in a Bezos fashion, right? We're not going to have slides. We're going to sit and talk about what you read and we're going to, you know, have a team and assign you a project to work together on related to the chapter. So, you know, when you have uh, undefined expectations. What are one of those that we need to work on? And through the next quarter, they work together to help solve a, a problem in your organization. And then you bring them back in, they report on it, and you don't penalize them if they don't do well or whatever. You learn from it. You take it and go, okay, here, were, what were the good things? Here, how can we improve? Right? What can the next group work on? And the feedback already, and the book just came out, but the feedback already for those doing this is the millennials are feeling so valued and engaged. And there's not taking a lot of time in the leadership, right? Because it's here's the book, work in this team. And they're coming back. They're making improvements. They're learning about the organization. They're feeling valued. And they're increasing their loyalty. So I'm kind of excited that it's working oh. well. <coughs> Sorry. So what you're saying, if I hear you correctly, is you're reinforcing positives. Yes. That you're moving people forward by seeing and catching them do things right. Yes. It makes them want to do more things right. Right. And yeah. you're investing in them, you know? You're investing in them. Even if it's yeah. a little book or whatever you're doing, investing in them and, sh and empowering them to do something amazing that you may not even even defined, yeah. right? Let them fly. Let them fail. I mean, failure is good as long as you learn from it. And uh, it's, it's really resonating with the, yeah. the younger generation. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a big believer on building strengths and, and, and having people have wins um, and having people do what they're really good at. Yeah. Okay. One more tip. We're so glad you're listening to this episode of Training Unleashed, brought to you by Tortal Training. The difference between Tortal Training and other online training companies is we're primarily a training company with technology rather than a technology company that does training. Want to find out more? Just go to Tortal.net. That's T-O-R-T-A-L, Tortal.net. Uh, one more tip with uh, culture. There's so many. I, I think another problem we have, as you said, you've got the moving goalposts. 
but at the same point, uh, we tend to not balance our decisions very well, right? When we go to make a decision, we a lot of times will focus on one area. And, and even in training, we're here because we're doing training on this topic. Um, but we tend to not always consider the impacts on other areas in the organization or even in the person's personal life with what we're asking them to do. And by taking that unbalanced approach, are we allowed to curse on this, this podcast? It's not a or preference, not? but it's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I won't say it, but basically it's in the book if you want to read it. But if we focus on anything too much, we mess things up in other areas, right? And so yeah. I've actually have the scale patent pending that has three points that are the people, the public, and the performance. And it's really just a tool to make you think, even in your training, when you're developing your materials, did I consider how the topic I'm covering and what I'm asking them to do is going to impact their other parts of their work-life balance, of their ability to succeed in their roles. And you just, you, you go through those questions and, and see if you're taking a balanced approach. And if you're not, wherever you're putting more emphasis is going down in the too much focus area and the others are going up into the increased risk area. What are those and three P's again? So you have people, which is your workforce, right? Yep. You have the performance, which a lot of times gets left out, yep. which is, you know, it's your our, craft. It's your skill. Yeah, are you? Yeah, you know, we, we sometimes focus so much on one area, like the people want to yep. make them happy, or vice versa. We focus so much on the performance that we fire the people, and then the products suffer and everything else. Um, customers are not happy. And then that's where the public comes in. So that's where your customers, the market, um, your environmental impacts, those all fall into that public category. And you really need to consider those. And if, for those who know about risk assessments, um, whether it's Swiss cheese model or a bow tie model or whatever, that's what that's about, right? It's about Let's assess our risks and make sure we have the right barriers and mitigations in place so that we don't have either the risk events or severe incidents or repercussions uh, as a result. And I, I really think it's important when training to consider that balance. When we go yeah. out and we're demanding them to do something because that's the rule, it's the regulation. Sometimes it's not realistic to be done, and we have to step back and go, why isn't this working? You know, I, I have one, one example where in one place, everybody had to do the exact same thing, right? And whenever they weren't doing that exact same thing, they were fired. Hmm. Well, going out and doing a culture assessment, I found that the reason they weren't all doing the exact same thing was because some couldn't. So their body type wouldn't allow them to do that. Or the specific task they were doing would actually increase the hazards or in decrease their ability to get the job done if they did it that way. And they were being pressured to deliver, but also being told to do this other thing and they tore at each other. So in that situation, engaging the workforce to come up with solutions You'd be surprised what they can come up with that'll meet both if yeah. you just ask the right questions. Yeah. That's really cool. I like that. Good point. Okay. When we did the pre-talk, we talked about leaders and managers. And I want you to just talk a little bit. I don't want to lead you too much because that's unfair to you because I'm stealing your thunder. But talk about leaders and managers and what you're seeing in the world. Yeah, yeah. I, my world got expanded when I went to work with BP because I went to more of a global, a real global role. And, and I saw how leaders develop in other areas because there isn't a lot of regulation. So they do things more based on risk. But 
at the same point, a lot of their education systems are different, if they even have them. Here, our education system really focuses on building management skills. You do your homework, you take your test, you do what you're told, you pass the grade, you get the certificate. Um, that's all management activities, managing your tasks. Um, there are leadership programs out there. I, I was involved in, in junior achievement and things like that as well. Um, those are great, but they're few and far between. And in other areas, you'll see a lot more leadership development skills because they don't have that level of rigor around the requirements. Like now we teach to the test. It's it's getting so bad. Like my kids even, you know, it was five days before school was out and it's like, oh, our tests, our, our exams are done. You know, they're sending home all their schoolwork, but they're still there for five more days. You know, they're watching movies. Um, and I, I just think that's it's not a good approach to teach to a test. And, and you're seeing that in the business world, too. Yeah. And, and, it, and we need to develop the leaders and the millennials, too, the way we're bringing them up where everybody gets a trophy. They want to add value. The, the management isn't working. They don't want to be micromanaged. They want to be inspired. They want to be supported. They want to go out and, you know do great things and climb big mountains and, and, you know, get those trophies. And we have to create an environment where they can do that. And to do that, we have to build better leaders. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, you know, one of the problems we have is training is constrained to dollars and it's easy to measure if you're training people to improve, let's say, customer satisfaction or MPS scores, to say, okay, we do this customer service training, it's going to result in this improvement in, in our satisfaction or MPS scores, which should result in this improvement in referral, repeat business, ROI, perfect. Leadership, harder to prove ROI. Yeah. And then there are people, what if we train them and they leave? Yeah. What if we train no one on leadership and everyone stays? Um, so I totally agree with you. Um, you've got a great free offer. Before the free offer, though, your one last, I got one tip to give people. What is that tip? Well, just tagging off what you just said. We often penalize good leaders because we don't understand what they're doing. A good leader doesn't take credit for what they do. They go out and inspire others to be better than them. So we need to stop penalizing those who are leading and start understanding and recognizing those strengths before we're going to be able to really grow and improve and, and make a difference in the world. So that's a challenge to everyone is please be open to those oddballs who go out there and, and lead hundreds versus micromanage five. You know, they're, they're out there doing the things that will make a big difference in the long run. You just may not see it today. And uh, I, I, I feel very strongly about that. That's cool. I like that. I really, it's a good tip. Very good tip. Deep, thought-provoking tip. Soul, soul searching, yeah. So tell us about your offer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to tell you about my offer. Uh, I have a, a website, www.talaser, with an S, <laughs> dot com. And on it, uh, you can join the journey. Uh, you can read about it in the book. But if you, if you go on there, it's really my blog. I, I just keep up-to-date information on it. But if you join the journey, I will send you a free ebook of the first book, so you can learn more about the journey. There's some on the website, but really what that is is all of us pulling together to make commitments on how we can personally make a positive impact on the future. What can we do? What's in our control? I can't control you, but you can you can definitely see how you can make an impact. So uh, I'll, I'll give your listeners a free ebook if they go on the website within the next, what do we want to say? Well, people listen to this show 
years all the time. Later. Oh, so it's open years later. So guess what? If you register, just put the note in there that you heard about you heard about the free ebook offer on this podcast. And Training I'm, Unleashed. Training Unleashed. Yep. And uh, send you a free copy. Well, I just want to end by thanking you. I think you gave a lot of really meaningful tips for people and thought provoking, provo- thought provoking. Um, apologize for my hoarse voice um, to our listeners and to you and um, everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Thank you for having me. This has been training unleashed, but it doesn't stop here. Just go to trainingunleashed.net to subscribe to the show. That way, you'll never miss an episode, and you'll be well on your way to delivering training programs that are off the chain. We'll talk to you next time on Training Unleashed.